Good morning, students. Today we continue with our session on Marxism and literary criticism. In the last class, I gave you a general introduction to Marxist criticism and I gave the major ideas discussed by Terry Eagleton. He talked about Marxist criticism. Marxist criticism, he says that it is that larger body of theoretical analysis which aims to understand ideologies and by understanding ideologies it will ultimately contribute to our liberation and these ideologies are available to us through literature and then we talked about the major aims of Marxist criticism when you take a literary work, Marxist criticism tries to analyze the whole work by giving sensitive attention to its forms, styles and meanings and understanding it as the product of a particular history. And then we got this idea that literary work a literary work is not something like a product of a single individual and we can't explain this literary work based on the psychology of that particular author. We should actually think about the dominant way of seeing the world which is the social mentality or ideology which gets reflected through this literary work. We had we talked about this this particular Joseph Conrad's Nostrum, and later we talked about the case of other great authors of 20th century, and then we talked about the path of literature, the position of literature in superstructure, and how how it act as an active element in though it is part of superstructure. It is not merely the passive reflection of economic base, though it is true that art cannot bring about a change in the course of history, it can still be an active element. So we talked about the autonomy art has even though it is part of superstructure. Then we talked about this two Marxist approach, one is vulgar Marxist approach where all these works are studied just as the reflection of the ideological economic factors as the immediate reflection of historical conditions. While the true Marxist criticism understand all these literary works as mediating or consider that, consider that there is a whole series of levels, different levels which mediate between text and the capitalist economy. So, True Marxist criticism takes into account author's class position, ideological forms, spirituality, philosophy and all those aesthetic theories. So these were the major ideas we discussed in the last class. Now we move to the particular essay, particular chapter titled The Author as Producer. So till now we were trying to understand literature in terms of, of form, ideology as part of superstructure and so on. But in this chapter, he is trying to say that even though literature is an artifact, a product of social consciousness, a part of superstructure, something which, uh, which reflects or which has its which is held within ideology in this chapter he provides a different view or or an additional view that literature is also an industry here books are not just structures of meaning they are also commodities produced by publishers and sold on market at a profit. And drama is not just a collection of literary text. 
It is not a literary text. It is also a capitalist business to produce a commodity to be consumed by an audience at a profit. Drama is also a capitalist business to produce a commodity to be consumed by an audience at a profit. And when you take uh, the role of critics, critics are not just all those analysts of text. They are also to be seen as academics hired by the state. They are actually hired by the state to prepare students ideologically for their functions within capitalist society. So they have that additional role too. They are actually hired by, paid by the state to prepare the students uh, in, to mold them in an ideology that that fits the ideology of the society. And when you take the case of writers of that particular book, they are not just the transposers of trans individual mental structures. They are not there to transfer these mental structures. They are also to be seen as workers hired by these publishing houses to produce commodities which will sell. They are also workers. So Marx in his work Theories of Surplus Value says a worker, a writer is a worker not in so far as he produces ideas but in so far he enriches the publisher in so far he is working for a wage. So a writer is a worker. He works for the publisher and he works for a wage. And here in this particular chapter, Eagleton wants to discuss two Marxist critics. One is Walter Benjamin and the other one is Bechtol Brecht. And in the last class, I told you about art as the most highly mediated of social products in relation to its economic base. The most highly mediated of social products. But in another sense, when you take into consideration of all those things I discussed earlier, that a writer is a worker who enriches the publisher who is working for a wage, we should also understand though art act as something like highly mediated of social product, it is also in a sense one kind of economic practice, one type of commodity production like many others. So Walter Benjamin and Recto Ulbrecht sees art as this form of social production, a social activity, a form of economic production which exists alongside with other such forms. So they see literature as a text but also as a social activity, also as a form of social and economic production and that is why he is discussing, Terry Eagleton is discussing the ideas given by these two critics in this particular chapter. So let us begin with the ideas given by Walter Benjamin. As you know, he is one of the most original Marxist thinker, who is a German philosopher and critical theorist and he had this Jewish origin which made his life very dangerous in a Nazi period. He was always in exile and he was even forced to carry his own manuscripts in his briefcase. He had to carry his manuscripts always with him in his briefcase. And sadly, he killed himself before he was handed over to Nazis by Franco Spain, Franco government in Spain. And Walter Benjamin, in his 
essay titled The Author as Producer, he discusses certain questions like what is literary work's position with regard to the productive relation of its time? Or he puts it like this, what is the literary work's position within the relation of production of its time? What is the literary work's position within the relations of production of its time? And what Benjamin means by this is that art, just like any other form of production, depends on certain techniques of production. They have the certain modes of painting, certain modes of publishing, th certain modes of theatrical presentation and so on. And these techniques, these techniques are, are part of this productive forces of art the stage of development of artistic production. These techniques are part of this productive forces of art, also part of the stage of development of artistic production and they essentially involve a set of social relations. The social relations between on one side there is this artistic producer, the author and on the other side his audience. A set of social relations. So here Walter Benjamin is trying to trying to pose a question like what is the literary works posi position within the relations of production? So social relations between artistic producer and his audience. And we understand that a system is set for revolution when there is this clash between productive forces and relations of production. When productive forces and productive relations or relations of production enter into contradiction with each other, that system goes into a revolution. For example, the social relations of feudalism became an obstacle for capitalism's development of productive forces so there occurred a revolution and there is this overturning of this feudalism and coming up of capitalism and later the social relations of capitalism becomes uh, an obstacle for the development and uh, distribution of wealth uh, you see in industrial society and then there occurs a revolution. So, when there is a clash between productive forces and relations of production, the system ultimately goes into a revolution when this relation of production hinders the further growth of productive forces. And then he discusses what shall a revolutionary artist should do? What shall a revolutionary artist do? For Benjamin, an artist or a revolutionary, the revolutionary artist should not just blindly accept all those existing forces of artistic production, but instead he should develop and revolutionize those forces of artistic production. And doing that, he actually creates all those new social relations between artist and audience. He will overcome the contradictions, the contradictions between production, productive forces and relation of production and he will, he will, he will jump across that barrier of, of artistic forces. And here the task of a revolutionary artist is to develop these new media, use as new media and also his task is to transform the older modes, older methods of artistic production. It is not just by giving out a revolutionary message through his existing media, he should actually revolutionize the media itself. The truly revolutionary artist is 
never concerned with the art object alone, with the product alone, but with the means of its production too, the medium of its production too. And then he talks about the potential of the new medium. When you take uh, new media like photography, cinema, newspaper, these new media, they are available to all. And there is this melting down of borders between genres. For example, Benjamin sees that newspaper, in newspaper there is this melting down of borders between literary genres, between writer and poet, between scholar and popularizer, and even between author and reader. As Benjamin says that in newspaper, newspaper reader is always ready to become a writer himself. And then he talks about this gramophone records, which has overtaken the form of production known as the concert hall. And cinema and photography, they are profoundly changing this traditional modes of perception, all those traditional techniques and relations of artistic production. So here, the commitment of a revolutionary artist is not just presenting all those correct political opinions in one's art. Here, his role is to reconstruct the artistic forms at his disposal and his role is to turn authors, readers and spectators into collaborators. Everybody collaborates into this, into this work, into this artistic product. And Benjamin takes up this theme again in his essay titled The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Production which came out in 1933 and in that he says that all these traditional works of art have this aura of uniqueness, this aura of uniqueness, privilege and it always maintain distance and there is this element of permanence about them. But the mechanical reproduction of, 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 for example, mechanical reproduction of painting will replace that, that element of uniqueness with all those plurality of copies. It, it actually destroys that distance. It destroys that alienating aura and allows the beholder of that painting to encounter that work in his own place, in his own time, in his own space. So there in this mechanical reproduction that work of art loses its uniqueness, it loses its privilege, it loses its distance and the quality of permanence. And here he takes up two examples. One is portrait painting and then there is this film camera. He says, whereas this portrait keeps its distance, as you see in a portrait painting, it keeps its distance while the film camera penetrates. It demystifies. Demystifies. And as such, it completely subverts what is what is known as the quality of a traditional high art here in this case that of a portrait painting whereas this traditional painting allows you for a restful contemplation film actually gives it actually modifies your perceptions and it produces something known as shock effect shock according to him, is a central category in aesthetics. And there is this debate between George Lukács and Walter Benjamin over the idea of wholeness and fragmentation. 
as you know this modern urban life is essentially characterized by this collision of fragmentary and discontinuous sensations and for lukaj it is actually a sad fact a gloomy index of fragmenting of human wholeness under capitalism for him it is a gloomy fact of the this fragmentation of wholeness while benjamin tries to see its positive possibilities the basis of progressive artistic forms and according to him shock experiences will will strip objects and experiences of their aura of uniqueness of of distance of permanence and this artistic equivalent of this of this shock effect is the technique of montage if you have watched this soviet cinema soviet montage where there is this this connection or connecting of this dissimilars to produce a shock in the audience which will ultimately lead to an insight and that montage becomes for benjamin a major principle of artistic production in a technological age and now we move to the ideas of brechtol brecht his ideas related to epic theater as you know benjamin was the close friend of brechtol brecht and he was the first champion of brechtol brecht brecht as you know has have uh, ha, he has this experimental theater epic theater and for benjamin it it was a model of how to change not merely the content of art how uh, to change the whole apparatus itself the whole apparatus itself here what happens is dismantling destruction of that traditional naturalistic theater or what is known as bourgeoisie theater which had this illusion of reality and brecht in this experimental theater he produced a new kind of drama based on this critique of ideological assumptions of bourgeoisie theater this new kind of drama generated a critique of this ideological assumptions you see in bourgeoisie theater and at the center of this critique is is this famous concept known as alienation effect so the partnership between benjamin and brecht it is something like one of the most absorbing chapters in the history of marxist criticism now we'll look into the features of bourgeoisie theater bourgeoisie theater it is actually based on this idea of illusionism it takes for granted the assumption that dramatic performance should should directly reproduce the world it should be the immediate re reflection of the world it its major aim is to draw an audience by the power of this illusion to to capture this audience or hypnotically capture this audience and its major aim is to bring out empathy in the audience with the performance and they wanted the audience to take the performance as real and and they wanted the audience to feel enthralled by it there is this feeling of wholeness the audience in bourgeoisie theater is something like a passive consumer of a finished unchangeable product which is the which is the drama performance and here it does not stimulate them to think constructively of how it is presenting its characters and events they just passively consume what is there in front of them and this dramatic illusion conceals the fact that it is constructed it prevents the audience from reflecting critically or 
or thinking constructive on both the modes of production and the action represented. They just passively consume without reflecting critically on these aspects. And the basic The basic underlying fact regarding bourgeoisie theatre is that or the ideological belief behind this bourgeoisie theatre was, was the idea that the world was fixed, given and unchangeable and they had this ideological belief that the function of a theatre is to provide some kind of escapist entertainment for the audience. And what Brecht wanted to portray through his experimental theatre or big theatre was that, that he wanted to put forward this, this view that reality is a changing discontinuous process, not something like fixed as you saw in bourgeoisie theatre, the idea that world was fixed, given and unchangeable. Here, he had this completely opposite view that reality is a changing discontinuous process produced by men and it is produced by men so it can be transformed by men too. And play itself there becomes a model of that process of production. Here, the task of theatre is not to reflect a fixed reality, but to demonstrate, but to portray how character and action are historically produced. And so, how could, how could they be different? Therefore, the play itself becomes this model of that process of production. It is less a reflection of than a reflection on social reality. It is, a, it is less a reflection of than a reflection on social reality. Here, the play presents itself as a discontinuous, open-ended, internally contradictory, engaging the audience in that complex scene. They become more alert to this several conflicting possibilities at any particular point. And what are the actors doing in Brecht's theatre? In Brecht's theatre, the actors instead of identifying with their roles, they are instructed to distend themselves from them, themselves from these characters. To make it clear that they are just actors in a theatre, they are not individuals in real life. They just merely show the characters rather than become them. They just show the characters rather than become them. And the actor will only quote his part. And he communicates a critical reflection on it in this particular act of performance. And here we see that the organic whole you see in a, in a naturalistic theatre is completely disrupted. Here what you see is, is a kind of uneven, interrupted, discontinuous juxtaposition of happening in scenes. It is completely different from the organic unit, organic unity which carries an audience into a hypnotic level. It completely disrupts that conventional expectations and forces the audience, it forces the audience into that critical speculation to think or reflect critically on the dialectical relations between these episodes, these scenes. So here the play becomes an experiment, it is incomplete and here 
we see that they use different art forms which refuse to blend smoothly with one another. Here, this organic unity is disrupted by the use of different art forms, for example, film, back projection, song, choreography, which refuse to blend smoothly with one another, cutting across the action rather than, rather than neatly bringing it to the, together. So, in this way, the audience is forced to have that several conflicting modes or forced to understand that several conflicting modes of representation. The result is alienation effect. The audience are forced to alienate themselves from the performance so that it prevent them from emotionally identifying with the play. Alienation effect shows up family experiences in an unfamiliar light, forcing the audience to question the attitudes and behaviors. It is actually the complete opposite you see in bourgeois theater, which naturalize even the most unfamily events so that audience consume it passively. Here in alienation process, audience are free to make judgments on the performance and free to make judgments on the actions they see on the stage and thereby they become something known as an expert collaborator along with the performers rather than consumer. And even Brecht would rewrite his play based on the audience's reactions and they are encouraged to participate in that rewriting. Therefore, as I said earlier, here play becomes an experiment. It is incomplete in itself and completed only in the audience's reception of it. And it completely stops being a breeding ground of fantasy. It is not a breeding ground of fantasy anymore. It comes to more or less resemble what is known as a, a, a combination between a lab, circus, music hall or a, even a public discussion hall. So here what you see is a scientific theatre which is actually appropriate to the scientific age. And Brett wanted people to respond to it with, with sensuousness and humour. It is said that he liked them to smoke. He wanted the audience to think about the action, to refuse to accept it blindly or uncritically. But it doesn't mean that you should or the audience should completely discard emotional response. He says, one thinks feelings and one feels thoughtfully. So here ends the first part of this chapter titled The Author and as Producer. Hope it is clear. Thank you. Have a nice day.